Hello, my name is Brandon Cleaver. I'm an associate professor of civic leadership here at the Staley School of Leadership. I'm here uh, just for a few moments to consider this question with you. What is the role of civic leadership in the political sphere? So uh, what prompts this uh, short little video is the upcoming primary election here in Kansas. Uh, in 2019, the Kansas Supreme Court ruled that the Kansas state constitution recognizes a right to bodily autonomy, and that includes the right to an abortion. Uh, currently, the, the state of Kansas uh, is considering a proposed constitutional amendment, essentially that will give citizens the choice to amend the Kansas state constitution. Um, and essentially, what the people of Kansas are being asked is, should the Kansas constitution recognize a right to access an abortion? So you'll notice uh, we've been uh, talking a lot about the uh, August 2nd election and we've gotten some questions from our alumni, from our students, and, and we get typically, typically get this in our undergraduate courses in the minor. And so these questions typically evolve around why does a school leadership care about political issues and what is the role of civic leadership in addressing political issues? So I am um, trying to make this short little video to help clarify uh, the political dimension of civic leadership. Uh, before diving in specifically to the political elements of civic leadership, I just wanted to highlight maybe a historical entry point for those of you that are interested in constitutional history. Uh, when I was taking a graduate seminar with Dr. John Rohr, uh, he first shared this with me, and this has shaped my thoughts on civic leadership for quite some time now. Uh, but I'm sure all of you or many of you are familiar with the First Amendment. Uh, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Uh, you know, many of us know of this as the five freedoms of the First Amendment. But if we peel back and think about this a little bit differently, it shows maybe uh, ways in which our founding fathers were thinking about the role of civic leadership in our, our society. Uh, you know, when we think about our structure of government and our commitment to freedom and democracy, there is a significant role for citizens and associations to exercise leadership to make things run well. Um, and I think the First Amendment these and these five freedoms give us kind of a glimpse of what may be the approach to leadership, civic leadership that our founding fathers were thinking of, right? So freedom of religion um, and um, uh, free exercise thereof, we might think of this as freedom of conscience, right? The idea that uh, individuals and groups should be able to uh, develop their own frameworks of thinking about what the good life would require. And that, and when they do that work of, of thinking about what's required to live well, they should be able to discuss it. They should be able to sh uh, uh, have freedom of speech to share those ideas widely. Um, and then if in some ways uh, you wanna mobilize even more, uh, we associate that with freedom of press, right? We think about uh, this as maybe offering different interpretations of what the good life might look like. And then those final elements of freedom of freedom to associate, we might think about this as mobilizing others around the issues and values that we care about. And that if for some reason, government structures, policies and laws are not recognizing those values and those commitments, we would petition the government, right? And so these five freedoms offer a cycle that we might offer uh, for a model of civic leadership and maybe initial thoughts of what we think about civic leadership in a uh, you know, historical and contemporary perspective. Uh, but for those of you that are familiar with adaptive leadership, right, the observe, interpret, intervene cycle overlays very nicely with this, uh, this different kind of alternative interpretation of the five freedoms. So I just offer this as a way to think about one, uh, civic leadership and the role of civic leadership runs deep in American society. And two, uh, you know, I think some of our uh, understandings of individual rights and the Bill of Rights are shaped differently. And I think this offers kind of a unique lens and entry point into what civic leadership ought to be. So going back to kind of the initial question of what's the role of civic leadership in the political sphere, first off, just want to highlight a little bit about how the Staley School of Leadership thinks a little bit about the civic sphere. So uh, this is contextualized within ecological systems and a context in which values multiculturalism and value pluralism, the idea that 
Uh, we have lots of different kind of cultures and contexts in which shape our experience and that we value, value, value pluralism, the idea that there are lots of different ways and conceptions of people uh, shaping the way they think they should live their life. And when we think of this larger question of how do we live well together, it's, con it's nested in this, this reality that there's lots of ways and lots of competing ways. And that's part of the strength of our uh, American system, right? We're not saying there there needs to be one way, but instead uh, there's many multi-value plural ways, right? And those uh, uh, elements are context contextualized within a political, social, economic, and public ethics sphere. And this diagram represents those spheres as equal size and kind of equal relationship. But the reality is these are constantly moving, both in size and location. Uh, when we think about the work of civic leadership activity as an effort to define the common good, oftentimes negotiating the relationship between these spheres is the work of civic leadership, right? Creating um, processes and practice that allow people to understand and realize what would achieve the common good um, through the arrangement of these different kind of spheres and relationships. So let me pull out that political aspect of civic leadership. So first off, you know, Lots on political sphere, invite you to do more reading uh, if you're interested in the different conceptions of what we mean by the political. But in the context of civic leadership activity, we're often talking about small p politics. So essentially kind of process and practice that uh, leads to kind of collective group decision making. We're not talking about partisan politics, you know, R versus D, right, or, um, you know, uh, kind of the um, back and forth of gotcha type of, you know, political dimensions. We're talking about how decisions get made in groups, right? Or, and how different institutional structures inform the way we structure our life and organize our life. So one way that we talk about civic leadership and the political dimensions of civic leadership in our undergraduate courses is talking about small p politics as equaling power and choice. And by breaking it apart this way, it gives us a lens to analyze uh, contemporary political issues and understand how we might intervene from a leadership activity perspective. So power, power over, power to, power for, power with, and power within. And we, when we move from left to right, we also, in some ways, assume certain levels of legitimacy that are associated with that due to kind of our structures of government and our commitments and values as Americans. Right. Typically, we're very suspicious of arbitrary power over. We assume inherently that that when someone's exercising power over that there might be some form of domination or uh, unfair or unjust power relations that are associated with it. But then as we move from left to right, we see power two and power four, maybe recognizing different types of forms of representation in a system or an organization or even maybe uh, authorization within a formal role that would allow you to exercise some authority over people um, in order to uh, recognize what's been assigned to you. Uh, when we think about power with and power within, I think these are the kind of aspirational, uh, most fully formed uh, goals of our kind of civic life. The idea that when we're organizing and mobilizing with others, we share a power with and that in some ways, when the power rests in the people, this is the most kind of legitimate form uh, and use of power. And power within is this idea that when we develop an understanding of self, that we can influence uh, collective decisions and civic life, we see ourselves differently. So there's a power within, almost a, a certain type of identity. And so when we combine that with the aspects of choice, it allows us to kind of start understanding how process and practice within community, within organizations, within systems and institutions uh, shape how things are going, right? And a civic leadership activity perspective would start using power and choice to analyze whether uh, a political issue is being contested productively or what's going on, right? And, and, and creating the conditions for people to see that is part of what that leadership activity might look like. So when we talk about choice, we talk about the circumstances of a choice. We talk about the quality of a choice and processes used to determine the range of choices available to people, right? So the circumstances of the choice might be like, what, what's leading up to this choice? Why is there... Um, uh, some type of context in which a choice needs to be made. The quality of the choice would look at, you know, is this really 
uh, high quality choice, right? right? One example might be a um, simple example. We walk down to uh, the grocery store and there's about 50 million different types of toothpaste. We might say, oh, look, wow, we have lots of choice. But instead, if we really unpack that a little bit, most of those toothpaste are about the same. So is that really a quality choice? I don't know, maybe not, right? So that, that, that quality of choice thinking about uh, what outcome would we realize is, is part of what we want to analyze and think about. And processes to use to determine the range of choices available to people, uh, right? Is it, is it almost meaningful, right? Is the choice, is it a false dichotomy? Uh, is there meaningful differences between the choices available uh, to groups of people? These frames of power and choice help civic leadership activity add depth to political issues and political dimensions. So what does civic leadership look like for the August 2nd constitutional amendment vote? Uh, one way that I would think about this is creating the conditions. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, when we think about civic leadership activity and especially civic leadership activity from maybe a complex adaptive systems perspective, it's about creating containers in which people can come together productively to think through an issue, right? And that's inherently what a political dimension of civic leadership would include. So one way this might look is creating spaces for productive disagreement. Right, regardless of, of, of what we think about the issue of abortion, there's this is a contested issue, right? And one of the things that I've noticed is that it's pretty confusing when we look online around what this vote actually entails and what it includes and what it doesn't include. Uh, so, good civic leadership activity might tease apart and provide better information to have better disagreement on, on what our constitution should look like. Right. Maybe another another way we might think of leadership in this context is what's the appropriate scope of government and creating meaningful conversations around that. Uh, Kansas has a long legacy of exploring this question of what's the appropriate scope of government and good civic leadership activity might be creating the conditions for people to come around uh, uh, and think about this issue through that lens. And then maybe the final example that I'd offer is a process that makes apparent what aspects of power and choice are being contested, right? So politics is inherently about contestation and that there's reasonable people could come to reasonable different conclusions and having a framework to understand those elements of contestation could be helpful. And in this perspective, we might think about this through the lens of legislative process, right? If the constitution's amended, this would change what legislative powers uh, would be available to, to our, our legislators, right? So we might think about, is that power and choice appropriate for how we want to live, right? Or what we live well together uh, in, the, in Kansas. And then also, how might this impact uh, for women or people that can become pregnant? How do we think about their power and choice within this context? Creating spaces for us to productively analyze and understand and communicate these political dimensions of civic leadership, I think are essential to advancing a common good in Kansas. And finally, before I leave you, I just want to acknowledge and recognize that regardless of the outcome of the August 2nd election, um, there's going to be a lot of loss, right? And I think important important aspect of civic leadership is being able to speak to that loss, also increasing our trust in our institutions, in our neighbors, in our communities, and also acknowledging, and I hope this is an acknowledgement, that when we think about our civic life here in Kansas, that we honor and recognize the inherent dignity of our neighbors. And if we can create a context and container for that to exist, that's the most important civic leadership activity that, that we could be advancing in my mind. So thanks for being here today. Uh, hopefully we'll see you around the building or we we'll see you through our virtual programs. Um, thanks for listening in and, and we'll, we'll catch up soon. Have a good day.